When Death Battle premiered Goku vs. Superman 2023, it attempted to go for another thematic note to end on, but this one was a lot different than the other episodes. Instead of making it thematically cohesive to their verdict, they had Wiz concerned about whether or not he was simplifying characters or whittling them down to mere action figures. But then Boomstick assuages Wiz's thoughts by saying that there is more than one way to appreciate something. As a longtime fan of the show, this resonated with me because it shows that they really do care about the characters and want to not just represent them, but celebrate them and the series that they come from. Other people view this as a show that merely determines who would win in a fight, but no. I've always interpreted it as them expressing their love for various works of fiction in their own unique way. And over the past few years, they have done an immaculate job celebrating the characters and franchises as well as representing the characters as accurately as possible. <laughs> okay, fine. Speaking as a longtime fan of Death Battle, I won't deny that you could make an entire museum exhibit's worth of recent examples that go against this idea. It can be way too easy to tell when the Death Battle team represents a character poorly or just doesn't know the characters very well. But with that said, I do believe that Death Battle has been taking accurate character portrayal far more seriously in Season 10 at least, where the team has stated on multiple occasions that this season's theme was passion projects. Every episode from Season 10 was an episode that someone on the team yearned to make. And you can feel this passion in every project from Season 10, be it through a riveting analysis, a strong presence in the fight, a combination of both, or some other special case that makes you rethink the episode, or even Death Battle itself. And in my opinion, no episode represents this better than my new favorite episode of the entire show. <laughs> I'll kill them! All of them! Down to the last one! Notice that I said favorite and not best. Rare sighting for a YouTuber to distinguish that, huh? Also, you really think that Bill Cord and Scourge stands are gonna accept me saying that this episode is better than both of them? Do you see what happened when an RPG fanboy makes death battle content? You get takes like this. But whatever. Guts vs. Dimitri was Chad James's passion project due to Guts being one of his favorite characters in all of fiction. Even before his first outing in season 2, he had wanted Guts on the show for years. And even if it still feels like his first opponent was pulled out of a hat, at the end of the day, Ben and Chad really wanted to make the episode. But despite being well received on release, it really started to show its age year after year. I mean, yeah, old episode is old. Who would have thunk? Though the animation still holds up, everything else about it started receiving criticism to varying degrees. Degrees. And with that in mind, Season 10 was a great time to bring Guts back, and also debut one of the most anticipated franchises of the show. Ben Singer had wanted Fire Emblem on the show for a really long time, although it wasn't immediately assumed that both would happen in the same episode, as Guts' biggest opponent during the time was Claire from Claymore, which even lead researcher Liam Swan said was the most interesting idea for Guts in his opinion. But she wasn't even the only idea, as the Death Battle team considered a bunch of different ideas for Guts outside of Claire, but after considering Considering several factors that most of which are locked behind the one, two, nope, don't ask, they finally picked one. Weed eater. Ah, that's a good one. Contrary to popular belief, though, the 3D model reason was not even half a percent close to the deciding factor. It could be a long time before we get the official reason why they went with Guts vs. Dimitri, but just know that this wasn't it. And when the episode was later announced, even Guts vs. Claire fans were genuinely happy for Guts vs. Dimitri fans. And given the intense rivalries that can stem from... <clears throat> liking a versus matchup, this is a rare W, and it's already become a fan favorite. So let's start the preamble and get into why Guts vs. Dimitri is my new favorite episode in all of Death Battle. Unless season 11 or 12 become based enough to overtake it and make this entire fundamentally worth- Wait, hang on, did I say start the preamble? <laughs> 
before revisiting this video, I decided to get around to reading the Berserk manga just so I could both see the appeal of the series and even to get an idea of what kind of episode I would expect to see. I'm nowhere near done with it, but in my defense, nobody's finished reading Berserk yet. But as I read through the Golden Age and started setting sail, I randomly started getting flashbacks of Guts' previous analysis against Nightmare and realized that they left out so much of Guts' story despite going in depth with it. In my initial revisit for my Death Battle ranking retrospective, I completely missed this because I just liked the presentation and hearing about his tragic backstory, so as a series outsider, I kind of assumed that his analysis was good. I still don't think it's bad, but I can't deny that it removes a lot of the nuances from the manga, and has some unique issues of its own. To begin with, Boomstick refers to Shisu as the camp whore for no reason, while also refusing to name drop her. Yes, this was a recurring theme of the episode, and even this season too. While Shisu isn't that important in the grand scheme of the story, if you're gonna introduce her, at least say her name and mention that she was in a relationship with Gambino, and they also say that Gambino was abusive in ways that Boomstick didn't want to go into. Boomstick seems too hesitant to dive into Guts receiving a scar, getting kneed in the chin, and being sold off one time, and yet he shows no restraint in describing Griffith's betrayal in complete detail, despite being far more gruesome in every way, but okay. Guts' analysis in this episode felt like it was more interested in covering how dark the series is, how much pain he had to endure, and how much of a badass he is just for having a big sword and other weapons. I've always found media literature during the early internet days very amusing because many people, specifically screw attack personalities, had the funniest double standards. Though I'm not shaming Death Battle for it because everyone's biased, but I have seen people say that Gus's season 2 episode is worse retroactively because of this type of focus, which I agree with in a vacuum, but there is actually an explanation as to why it was written like this. The episode was made during a time where Ben Singer had to do most of the writing himself. He was going through some personal things relating to his family, the passing of Monty Oom, and the dark period of season 2, but something I neglected to mention was that working on Guts vs Nightmare was actively making him depressed in spite of his love for Soul Calibur. While yes, Guts vs Nightmare was after the dark period, Ben still had to research a good chunk of the actually dark content in Berserk all by himself, given that Chad hadn't even finished reading the manga during the time, so he wouldn't have helped with the research as much as Ben would have wanted him to. All of this piled up on Ben's mental health, and even reaching a point where he questioned if he should keep working on Death Battle in general. Though well, thankfully, Zach Watkins gave him a battle animation that made him feel better, and he would get down to tasks so brass they were eventually gold by the literal next episode. But with this context in mind, it's kind of hard for me to call Guts's old analysis bad, even in comparison to his new one. Also keep in mind, Gus was still stuck on that boat during the time the manga was taking place. The poor unfortunate soul. Once we got off of that boat, however, we would have a different writer for Guts's return, Herschel Lousyton, easily my favorite writer in all of Death Battle. I like most of the former and current writers' writing styles, but Herschel, despite a rough start, has consistently shown to highlight my favorite aspects of a death battle analysis. His works put a lot of emphasis on a series of world building and deep dives into what made a character the way they are, and then cover their feats and abilities in ways that complement the stories, which is especially beneficial in fantasy-oriented stories with lots of lore. I very recently praised episodes like Sauron vs. Lich King for doing all of these, so when Guts vs. Dimitri was in the planning stage, he assigned himself to write it because he loved Berserk, and he was also an immense Fire Emblem fan, so I already had a gut feeling that this was going to be one of his best works. This episode of Death Battles brought to you by BetterHelp. Yeah, they sure do need some better help, am I right, boy? <laughs> Okay, so now the preamble is over, which means we can talk about how Guts' second analysis establishes a completely different tone from his 2015 episode. Herschel wanted Guts' character growth to be highlighted because not too many outsiders knew much about it, especially since pretty much every single adaptation of Berserk hasn't really adapted it at all. So with that in mind, as well as just the general perception of Berserk that Death Battle may or may not have been directly responsible for in some capacity, people only saw Berserk as the super dark and edgy black swordsman Manga. But here, all the content relating to how dark Berserk gets was mostly skimmed over. They reference some familiar beats like his birth and what Griffith did during his betrayal, but it doesn't feel as drawn out this time, and we don't get any quirky one-liners like definitely not his best day, or any of that malarkey. Except for the closest being when Boomstick refers to Griffith's betrayal as some really bad things. But this feels more genuine because of how differently Gus's backstory was framed. For example, Gambino's abuse was framed differently solely through subtle word choices. They both say that he trained Guts since he was 6 years old, but his Season 10 episode implies that Gambino forced him into combat, whereas his Season 2 episode implies that Guts became a soldier of his own volition, as if he wanted to be groomed into becoming the scariest man in the world. 
That's a choice of words. Boomstick also makes a callback to how Gambino's abuse made Boomstick feel uncomfortable again, but it's so short that you wouldn't even know he was referencing that. Plus, it getting less focus means that there's more time to flesh out Gus's backstory with Griffin. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Griffin! Both episodes cover the bare necessities of Griffith's life, calling him ambitious, saying that he recognized Gus for his skill, mentioning that the Band of the Hawk was Gus's first taste in friendship, and covering how they ended a 100-year-long war before going into Griffith's torture. Again, the difference the difference here is how it's framed through these subtle word choices. Instead of just saying that Gus was recognized for his skill generally, they altered the wording so that they say how Griffith specifically was impressed with his skill. It's less broad and more in line with Griffith's motivations. They also give something of an explanation for why Griffith betrayed Gus. It's just a single sentence and doesn't directly go into how his friendship with Gus was getting in the way of his dream, but it still works given that the reason for his betrayal was technically never directly explained in the story, at least not at first. And then they bring up Gus's vow to murder Griffith and all of his demons down to the last one. Both analyses do follow it up with his weapons, abilities, and feats, but with his last analysis, that's how it ends. But in his second episode, there's a lot more going on. The best thing about this new analysis is that they actually name drop Casca. I know that sounds like I'm bobbing for compliments, but she actually becomes relevant throughout the analysis. They name drop her after Griffith's really bad things, and they eventually go into how Guts left her in a broken state. This was just one aspect of their coverage of Guts' mental trauma, which they bring up after mentioning the temptations from his Beast of Darkness, his tendency to shoulder his trauma alone, and the insane feat of demolishing every single monster in his way. All of this adds as payoff to the part where Guts found camaraderie in his new allies, and then they start giving numbers for his feats and covering the most impressive things that he's done. Wiz even outright says that Guts needed to do this to restore Casca's sanity. This, to me, says that Guts' character growth made him stronger not just mentally, but physically as well. They even end off on the same note of his previous episode, but instead of coming across as, Gus is super dangerous and badass, stay out of his way, it comes across as, Guts will protect his allies until the end, so stay out of his way. Such minor alterations, yet they come a long way in changing the tone of Gus's analysis from a coverage of the badass function with a big sword to the analysis of a tragic character with a buttload of trauma who learns to become a compassionate person that will stop at nothing to help his friends. But Dimitri's analysis, on the other hand, as someone who spent the waiting period getting around to revisiting Fire Emblem Three Houses and then completing the Blue Lions route, Five months later, this was fantastic coverage for his debut. I mean, they say that he likes eating weeds, so you know that they're taking this seriously. They cover a lot of world building from Crest to the Garrick Mock Monastery to everyone's favorite Smash Brothers character, Professor Bailiff. There had to have been a reason you played the announcer's voice clip. They do admit to compositing all of the game's routes as well as Three Hopes, and while I have seen a few people take issue with the former, I'd argue that it's especially necessary here because Berserk has over 350 chapters worth of feats. Though I I do understand that some people take issue with death battle scaling characters to others in general, but I am curious as to how they would determine the power of characters who have no direct feats of their own. I mean, the most I can guess is that they'd base their arguments around a framing of anti-feats. <laughs> Could you imagine if death battle based their bulk of their verdict around an anti-feat? Oh wait, you don't have to imagine that because there was a time where death battle did exactly that and so many people rightfully called them out on it. Why would you want to see that happen again? I don't get you people. <laughs> Uh, whatever. I'll let you guys rant about scaling in the comments I won't be reading. I only read comments from people who like my videos, subscribe to my channel, and join my membership program. This route compositing also transitions into my favorite cutaway gag of the season. It's literally just three houses discourse and I am all for it! Plus, I think that the houses they go with are the best options for each host. Boomstick likes the Golden Deer because he thinks Claude is such a bro, and the rest of the Golden Deer class is filled with fun personalities who would likely go around sharing beers and expressing their desires to steal ducks from the church. Wiz picks the black eagles because he's always been more of a morally gray scientist, so I feel like he'd be attracted to morally gray characters. Heck, even in Dimitri's preview, he literally says, Edelgard did nothing wrong. <laughs> Okay, I know that this was never gonna be in the final episode, but I wish that it was, as it's just so perfect for Wiz specifically. But then again, it's likely best to save it for when she ends up fighting Kylo Ren, or Van Grant if they want to not be cowards. He also picks it for how they're a more cohesive unit, so he seems to be picking it for Edelgar's strategic brilliance instead of the people in the house. And Jocelyn cuts in to shill the Ashen Wolves, the least well-known house. Boomstick says that she's in it for the goth, but I always believed it was because she prefers the more obscure things in life, given the research she does for Desk of Death 
battle. And the commentary also confirmed that Dummy's favorite house would be the Blue Lions. I mean, go figure, they're both sad boys. Oh, and also they show Amphibia footage in a non-Amphibia episode. Impressive, very based. As for how they tackle Dimitri's story, Dimitri also has one of those analyses that use specific word choices that state who he is during a point in his story. They don't just mention the events, but they also summarize how Dimitri felt about it and how it shifted his personality. They also highlight his journey in ways that complement the respect thread, like explaining crests and their functions, and then go into how strong Dimitri was with just one crest. Or how he was never proficient in magic, but eventually learned some neat magic skills after studying in the monastery. These were used to highlight his strengths and weaknesses from from before attending the monastery, which lead into how Byleth was the one who taught Dimitri how to master the various weapons and a bunch of other skills that he can use in combat. And then after they cover AD's betrayal, they start talking about Eridvar, and then they say he used it to commit peak war crimes. Okay, I know that this is a case of Death Battle trying to be quirky with meme language in an analysis where they're supposed to be taking it seriously, but this one is actually appropriate because, well, this is Fire Emblem, a game series with wars in it, and Demetrius slaughtering people, which is a crime especially after he vowed to kill every last one of them. And then they mention Byleth again as the one to help Dimitri out of his broken state, and how they helped Dimitri find out that the people of Fargus still honored him, past and all. After they cover his character growth, they transition into his feats. But this time, it's more so that he already had the strength from his previous experiences, and the feats in question mostly involve scaling him to other characters. I don't think it's done as well as how it was worked in Guts' rundown, but it still fits with how his character arc is about how he's always loved by the people of Fargus, Argus, and how he's defined by his strengths of today and not his failures of the past. Finally, they end it off with a brief dissection of his final confrontation with Edelgard, and then end it with how his new character growth will find him peace. Which is a callback to an earlier part of the analysis where they mention how he was unable to find peace given the number of lives that were lost. This is especially apparent because, contrary to popular belief, Dimitri never grew out of his trauma. The tragedy still haunted him even after he grew. His arc was focused on getting over his revenge quest, focusing on being compassionate for the people in his life, and bettering the people of his kingdom, which he would actively work towards. I really like how Death Battle framed his ending this way. After all, no one stays perfect the moment they experience growth. I guess if I had to criticize anything, it once again does that thing where they hide his strength numbers until the conclusion, so it's all like, gee, I wonder who's going to win! And while I still applaud their coverage of how the tragedy of Dusker affected Dimitri personally, not only does Lambert not get a name drop for some reason, but something that they don't talk about was that there was a lot of context as to what went on behind the scenes of the tragedy and how those secrets are periodically revealed throughout the Blue Lion's route. Granted, it is a lot of context, and it does dive into spoiler territory, but for now, all I'm gonna say is that, technically speaking, Dusker wasn't quite unjustly blamed for the tragedy. Also, I do need to give a shout out to DJ's editing, as it truly is remarkable across both analyses. Specifically with how he maneuvers all those berserk manga panels to convey Gus's powerful sword swings with clever timing and well-chosen sound effects, and that tragedy of Dusker edit with the rippling flames, the distorted screen, the movement of the font, and even the inverted color flickers. Though this analysis also has a few shots that are weirdly lit. And once every few Scarlet Nights, you'll find a panel or video clip with a noticeably lower quality than another one. Anyways, those are all my major complaints with the entire episode, and yes, I did say entire episode, because right now, it's time for a death battle. Right off the bat, we get one of my favorite establishing shots. It's a field based on the best season of the year, and the moon is big and bright enough to help the location feel memorable. In a show where a good chunk of older fights took place in a city, a barren area, or the depths of space, a snowy forest and a gloomy night is just the kind of distinction I needed. Even if most of the environment remains underutilized, but that's fine. Most of it is for visuals anyway. Like this tree in the middle, which is a callback to one of Gus's fights against Griffith, which, oh hey, also is in a snowy field, even with the mountain landscape. That's neat. And also, the opening lines help establish something even more interesting than the environment. 100 men strong. What drives your slaughter? Save the high and mighty crap till you're dead. Oh, jeez, Rick! It's in Meteo Res! That's bad! In Meteo Res can never make for a good death battle episode! That's not, that's, not, that's not how it works! 
I'm pretty sure that there's this one character from a franchise I don't really like that has a meme for this genre of opinion. What was it again? Oh yeah, I remember now. I disagree. To save you from a full lecture from the high and mighty triple major, when a story uses in media res, they then have to spend the rest of the story filling in the missing pieces of the backstory. You know, like how Shakespeare's Hamlet starts with- oh, oh, wait, Death Battle fans don't know what that is. Berserk itself starts in media res. It establishes the protagonist and antagonist, and then builds up to what led Guts to telling a fatherless child to go kill herself. But it does beg the question, how do you do this in a death battle where there's no room for any exposition? Well, let's take a look at how Death Battle has used these in media res setups before. When they tried this with Weiss vs. Mitsuru or Dragon Zord vs. Kiryu, they were fighting because... Of course it was gonna make no sense. Even episodes in season one had them walk up slowly and down smash the other dude to start a fight. But what about Miles versus Static? That one tried giving an explanation for why they were fighting, but they still kind of f***ed up a bit. The exchange says that the fight started because Static attacked Miles, but then it's revealed that Miles was the one who went after Static. While the context is there, it still has some missing pieces that never get elaborated on. Gus vs. Dimitri actually circumvents all of these issues in a really interesting way. The exchange I played establishes a reason why they're fighting one another, and Dimitri finds out what drives Guts' slaughter at the end of the fight. But wait, they're still missing context for who started the fight. Or is it truly missing? I will tear your head from your shoulders! The dead must have their revenge! <laughs> This line isn't just a funny fun fun reference, it's context to help the viewer infer that Dimitri had to have been the one who started the fight. I mean, how else would he have already known about Guts killing 100 men? Keep in mind that he mainly sought to kill those with massive body counts, so who's to say he wouldn't have thought the same of Guts? And no, this doesn't contradict the reason for his trauma. His loathing for killers is black and white. He'd kill Guts regardless. But wait, he said the line wrong! That, that, that's not how the line is supposed to go! Oh, shove that shitty criticism of yours down a latrine already. The idea is still there, and it's not gonna magically go away just because of a slightly different word choice. Though I should also point out that Goku vs Superman would give another go at in media res, and while I don't think it was handled as well, it's still handled well, because the full context for why they're fighting is given to the viewer almost immediately, and it allows the viewer to fill in the rest of the pieces themselves. Though another thing about this exchange is that it perfectly sets up the type of interlocution the episode's going for. It's meant to convey a contrast in their personalities. Dimitri's dialogue in Three Houses is always dramatic. Fantasy seers like Fire Emblem love their flowery language, and as for Guts, well, let's just say that he's never been a big fan of flowers who like to talk all high and mighty. Okay, to be fair, Guts is also prone to flowery language himself, but nowhere near to the same extent as Dimitri. They actually tried something like this in Deku vs. Asta, but in that episode, not only did it end up massively flanderizing one of the characters, debatably both, but it directly went against a core theme of the matchup. But here, none of those issues apply. It's much more in line with their general characterization, and while you could argue it's not super important to the matchup, that just makes it a supplementary aspect that helps the dialogue feel more interesting. The worst you could say about it is that it sort of caters towards Guts Guts' early characterization, but even then, it's not like his fighting style or behaviors when fighting people change that drastically. This was not the last time that they would attempt something like this. Episodes like Cole vs. Alex and Rick vs. the Doctor pulled this off, and it was extremely well done. You could even make a case that Bill Cord and Freezatron attempted something like this, and I wouldn't even argue with you. And this is something you can hear in the voice acting. Guts is voiced by Xander Stink and Mobitz, the Smash Brothers announcer! Honestly, I couldn't even tell that was him at first, even knowing that he was gonna be voicing Guts in this episode. He's used using the right amount of blunt and spiteful energy to make his lines sound as badass as Chad always believed Guts to be. Sure, he can never replace Mark, but I still take this over his voice in Guts vs. Nightmare. Not that it was bad, but it wasn't actually his. Guts' voice clips in that episode were reused from Siegfried's voice from Soul Calibur 4. No, seriously. Kevin Rivera as Dimitri is also really good. Definitely higher pitch than Chris Hackney's take, but Rivera gets the mannerisms down to a point where he may not sound like Dimitri, but he acts like Dimitri. Which, especially after Death Battle's Christmas episode, I'd rather take a voice that immaculately captures Dimitri's high and mighty behavior and vengeful persona, that just so happens to be a little different in terms of pitch, rather than a voice that does a spot-on impression, but fails to live up to the range that will be needed later on. You don't just see this type of duologue in this exchange, but and how they fight one another. Like when Dimitri drops the altered reference, and Guts responds by headbutting him. Which he also did in his previous episode. But in my opinion, this one's better, because even on the blinded side of his face, you can tell when he starts paying attention and when he's not having any of Dimitri's crap. Or at points like this, where Dimitri is always defending himself enough to a point where Guts has to smash through Dimitri's attacks with Dragon Slayer. Smashing? How does one smash? 
with a sword. Oh, it's quite simple, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the 2D effects, the after images, and Dimitri's hilarious facial expression showing how taken aback he is. It's just so funny to me for the reasons that I'm pretty sure they wanted. This is why I still love Death Battle even after all these years. It often goes ignored how good these animators can be at portraying a character's personality solely through how they fight. Except for when they don't do that, but when they know a character well enough, they're able to highlight their personalities in so many creative and fun ways, like with the aforementioned headbutt and Guts later decking Dimitri in the face. Both of these are representative of how Guts would fight, but this moment just had me rolling in the deep for that reason. Although I have heard some criticisms over Dimitri's HOW DARE YOU! While I kind of get them, I always hear it criticized under the context of him being offended by Guts landing a fatal blow, but that's not how I interpreted it at all. Dimitri was startled by Guts' tactic of using the blunt side of his sword to smack him in the face just to lead into that blow. And going off of my interpretation at least, this line is meant to be Dimitri realizing that Guts, for such a devastating level of power, did not fight in a way that lived up to the idea that Dimitri had in his head. This just accentuated his stress even more. That said, I can still understand why people feel like it's out of place, and I do believe that a grunt would have more than sufficed, but at least I can understand what purpose it's serving. And it does flow better with his following line as opposed to not saying anything at all. And then when when Guts tries another unorthodox tactic, Dimitri is actually ready for the deadlier blow. Aside from this bit with the frozen lance, where Dimitri tries to pin him in place and deal a finishing attack, but Guts' solution to get out of the bind is to use a combination of his sticky bombs and arm cannon to BLAST HIMSELF OUT OF THE ICE! Okay, I think now's a good time to talk about the quality of their animations, but first, let me eat all of this sugar so I don't have to coat this take of mine. I'm convinced that at minimum 80 to 85% of people on the internet, at least when discussing Death Battle, have no idea what jank animation actually is. Obviously I'm not counting any animators or people who work in the animation industry directly, I trust that they know jank when they see it. But for everyone else, there are way too many people who say that a certain animation looks jank and kind of assume that you know exactly what they're talking about. But no, Jesse, what the f*** are you talking about? I've talked about the differences in animation style between Torian Crawford, Devil Artemis, and the like, but people need to remember that Torian actually used motion capture for his animations. There's just no time for that nowadays. Hell, there was barely any time for that when they had mo cap given that his episodes were still very much not jank free. Dante vs Bayonetta is easily in my top 10 favorite episodes of the show, but even I have to admit, it is one of the jankiest fights he's ever made. And I still gave it a near perfect score. Now, I won't try and sound all high and mighty myself, as I'm not an animator, I don't have any experience in the industry, and animation was not one of my three majors. But in my defense, when I say that a certain animation looks good or bad, I at least try to explain why I think that way. I'll often scrutinize things like leading motion, posing, timing, expressions, impact, and the like. Guts vs. Dimitri is not jank free. Like there's this shot of Guts swinging Dragon Slayer downward by leading with his arms and randomly sliding forward instead of stepping into the attack. And there's also this attack from Dimitri where, while the motion and posing are fine, he ends up putting the wrong foot forward just before the attack lands. And there's also the killing blow with Dimitri's completely unanimating body crashing downwards at an awkward angle. That being said, I can't help but feel like people calling these newer animations janky are either looking at less than one hand's worth of examples or using that other hand to misrepresent what Death Battle tried to do with its animations. I may have touched on this once or twice with both of my hands before, but a lot of the animations can make more sense in context of what's happening in the fight. Even in those examples, while it may not justify the fundamental issues, they can at least make sense in context. The first animation is when Dimitri is knocked to the ground after taking a heavy blow, and Guts is trying to finish him off, so of course he'd go for a slash like this. And the sound design does its best to make the attack feel powerful. And the second animation, or at least the one before, might look jank because of Dimitri's weak stance, but keep in mind that he just tanked a headbutt from out of nowhere, and he was clearly staggering from that while trying to defend himself. Not even I could tank a random headbutt without feeling dizzy. And the final shot? I think the main issue is that it didn't live up to how stellar the rest of Dimitri's atrocity was handled be it the visuals, the critical hit card, and even this breathtaking shot of Dimitri preparing the final blow. Even then, I wouldn't call this animation bad, just one that needed to be at a straighter angle and maybe with a few less frames of movement. There are other shots that even I would mistake for bad animation or cinematography, but I would still say that there's nuance to it. Modern Death Battle's 3D animations mostly rely on shot reverse shot, which is fine, but sometimes it can feel like there are some awkward 
awkward cuts here and there. I'm sure it's prevalent in a lot of death battle animations, but Guts vs. Dimitri is not one of them. Or at least, it's not what you think. I can't really explain this through the animation alone, so let's morph this into another reality real quick. Pretend that this is supposed to be Dimitri. Brawl Vault can't seem to go 24 hours without collapsing in on itself. Taking that one sequence of Guts in the Berserker armor, even though the camera cuts to two different shots, both sequences are actually the same sequence told twice. The first shot consists of Guts swinging Dragon Slayer a few times, but then the next shot flips the camera around to show Dimitri dodging those same attacks. Same scene, two different perspectives. And I know that's the case with Guts vs. Dimitri because the animation of Guts roaring actually repeats for a bit in the shot of Dimitri setting up atrocity. It's blink and you'll miss it, but it's there. Regardless, which sounds more enticing? A fight scene with cool action but the same wide shot prolonging its welcome? Or a fight scene with basic action but with engaging camera movements, different shots highlighting different things, storytelling through other shots, a usage of aperture, etc, etc. If you'd rather have the former, fair enough, but let me sell you on why the latter can be far more interesting than you would expect it to be. One of the best aspects of the Berserk manga is how Mura was able to sell the motion of Guts' massive sword swings. This was something you would have to get right for a Guts animation. Not just with how they animate, but with how they feel as well. Guts vs. Nightmare did this okay, I mean about as well as a 2015 Death Battle sprite animation could be, but Guts vs. Dimitri expresses the advantages of 3D animations. You get a lot more freedom with key poses and frames. This camera work is honestly some of the best of any episode alongside Balrog vs. TJ, Ryu vs. Jin, and Sauron vs. Lich King. The dynamic angles, the stellar tracking, and even using shot reverse shot in places where you wouldn't even have noticed it. I especially adore this sequence where Guts starts to spin Dimitri around. The first time zooming in to highlight Dimitri Dimitri's facial expression, and the second time tracking Dimitri again, but mostly revolving around Guts' wide stance. Moments like these rely on the camera work to accentuate the spinning motion of Guts' swings. Along with that, we got Billy and the Viz Post team putting in a lot of work to make this animation pop off. They wanted to give it a cell shaded anime look, especially since the models are in different art styles with different levels of shading. You have your usual things like speed lines and motion blur to help sell swift motions even more, and wait, 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 go back a bit, go back a bit. Is that a smear frame in my 3D death battle animation? How? They'll also have some of Guts' swings consisting of Dragon Slayer being the one part of Guts that has motion blur. That, that, that's just like how Mura does it. That's so cool. And as for Dimitri's animations, they tend to be more reliant on speed lines and key poses. I mean, with a fighting style as defensive as Lance Combat, you need to ensure that the poses are strong, and they are. A lot of his attacks are more so inspired by Three Hopes rather than Three Houses specifically, but that's fine. From an animation standpoint, Three Hopes has far more interesting attacks and visuals. In the fight, he uses Tempest Lance, Frozen Lance, Atrocity, Thunder, and Thoron. It's kind of surprising how his Thunder Magic is in blue, like how Dimitri's Lance normally goes when it's imbued with lightning, yet when he does it when using Tempest Lance, it's green. I mean, I can live without it, as I feel like this could be stretched enough to reference the wind-torn ailment it deals in Three Hopes, but either way, I think the green looks cooler, especially since blue is the most overrated color of all time. Wait, was that out loud? But these effects can only carry an animation for so long. It's like my fellow sugary goat ABI once said, an animation should stand on its own before you add the bells and whistles to it. And aside from the aforementioned downward swing, Gus's attacks have his core body doing the movement for him, with proper follow-through from the arms. His key poses especially look like he exerted a lot of strength in his blows thanks to his wide stances and distinct posing. This is best shown when Gus is dodging Dimitri's thunder. There's this lovely shot of Gus recollecting Dragon Slayer in a fluid jump, and when he's running, not only is Dragon Slayer sticking out at all times to help the viewer keep track of where he is amidst the storm, but they even added distinct frames of Guts reacting to one thunderbolt and then casually dodging another, which then leads into the dagger throw which directly references Dimitri's final confrontation with Edelgard. Same position, same framing, it's all there. There are other references that the viewer will notice if they ever have a craving for eggs, but this one has the most fascinating execution to me. Dimitri's animations aren't as heavy, so they don't need to worry about conveying weight. But when they need him to show off more power, that's where they start using those keyframes and focus on the timing of his attack speed. One of my favorite examples is when he uses Tempest Lance. You might notice that he suddenly goes from holding it with one hand to two in a single frame. You'd think that this would be an animation error, but look at how much it adds to the attack's velocity. And likewise, no animation is complete without sound design, and to explain my thoughts, I would like you to close your eyes and listen. Close your eyes, all the way, all the way, just listen.
Hulk vs. Doomsday wishes it had this level of sound design. And same with Madara vs. Aizen, which I believe has some of the most top-notch sound design of the entire show. Yet Guts vs. Dimitri, in my opinion, surpasses both of those episodes by like 20,000 leagues. Other shoutouts go to Guts' Arrow Barrage for sounding more like what I can only describe as medieval machine gun fire. <laughs> Dimitri's Thunder sounding more like electric explosions. The actual explosion from Guts' arm cannon muffling everything with how much environmental damage it causes. And that bone crunching sound from the Berserker armor transformation. Not to mention that they utilize and even repurpose sound effects from Three Houses and Berserk 2016. They really did the funny swish swish clang clang sounds better than that Berserk anime nobody likes. Even having enough impact to distort the music and add a ringing sound overlaid on top of it. Home in Death Battle W. W4. Wow, this episode has a baller soundtrack to go along with it, doesn't it? Why yes, I did make a transcription for a death battle track. You want it? <laughs> well, join my membership program and you can have it. God's Hand might not be my favorite track of the season, but it's definitely one of the more slept on tracks overall. The instrumental feels very Fire Emblem coded with the trumpets in the background playing staccato notes and the texture and vibe of the singer's performance. I reckon that Logan Adams' vocal technique was trying to replicate the softer, grandiose tone of other Fire Emblem themes. But Berserk gets a lot of references in this track like the fight on lyric from the background feeling like a nod to various Berserk tracks that have vocals in them, which is quite a few from at least the 97 anime soundtrack. It also includes a piano sequence that heavily references Gus's theme from the 97 anime. <laughs> Although it doesn't have any direct references to any Fire Emblem themes, they do feature a lot of piano melodies in the music from the high octane to the slower paced, so it fits in quite naturally. And the second part of the chorus has a backing melody that could be referencing the King of Lions theme from Three Houses, but I still like how it enhances the chorus. <laughs> But what's interesting to note is that the episode has a completely different version from the release track that you can only get a clear listen to in the members exclusive AMV. Death Battle episodes have previously made some slight alterations to the music to better match the animation, but aside from Discordant, Decipher, and possibly Final Formers, Lil Papa's banger of a song has the most creative liberties taken. Not just with instruments being muted and soloed or the vocals cutting out, but entirely new sections of the piece. Like during the down to the last one scene, it plays a staccato melody featuring the cellos and trumpets. And this section ends in a brilliant twist where only the trumpets are playing the high notes and only the cellos are playing the lower notes. <laughs> Finally, the Berserker armor transformation onward features this simple yet badass choir synth sound that may just be the same chords, but the bass notes are being played by the low brass and eventually the lower electric. This track also has lyrics sung by your friendly neighborhood Hedge of Tomorrow vocalist and Berserk fanboy, Logan Adams. Keeping my lyrical analysis brief, I like to think that, while also having themes that work for Berserk, is most likely sung from Dimitri's perspective. The flowery language is used to help convey Dimitri finding out what drives Gus's slaughter, where he then fights it out and takes notice of how hard he's fighting through it, eventually leading to the final line where he says, I pray that you find your way out of this which is never actually sung in the animation. Also, I gotta give a shout out to this little line. Walking through all the blood and guts. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, let me rephrase that for you. Walking through all the blood and guts. When Yates solemn you, you still cannot hide sh from me. But wait, why was there so much of the track removed in the final episode? Well, simple. 
sound balancing. Hearing so many instruments mixed in the music combined with all the clanging would make everything sound too cluttered and noisy. Like, remember when Death Battle had Optimus Prime talking during Wings of Iron's verse? Or when Deku and Asta had their inner monologues blocking out the vocals? With that in mind, they were right to think, hey, maybe let's not have that in the episode where we want the viewer to pay attention to the dialogue. Also, the lyrics not being heard makes the ending more somber yet triumphant. Still standing? So we're both shackled to the dead. You foul beasts will not have his soul! Although, despite everything I've said, I guess I can understand why people wouldn't be too impressed with this fight and say that it's outright overhyped. The nature of these two combatants doesn't allow for the most creative action, especially in comparison to this season. But then again, you know me, I love me a grounded fight carried by an episode's stellar writing, cinematography, and characterization, even if I'm never bothered by an episode with elaborate massive arsenals. And I think that this episode has a healthy balance of both coupled with engagement camera work, but I can still see other people not remembering much of it. Still, I know for a fact that there are two scenes from this episode that everyone remembers, and they just so happen to be the most replayed parts of the video. I promise I'll kill them, all of them, down to the last one! This first scene takes place after Guts breaks free from the Frozen Lance. It lights the area on fire, triggering Dimitri's trauma from the tragedy of Dusker. And this shot of Dimitri's tiny silhouette being shown in the fire is so powerful. It also helps that that arm cannon blast was the most powerful blow Dimitri took up to this point. He may have shed blood in that one big swing, but at least he was able to get back up fairly quickly. This one kind of knocked him out while also taking away even more of his blood. And the first thing that Dimitri sees when he wakes up is fire all over the place. So of course the voices would come back. And as for Guts, his Beast of Darkness is tempting him to lose control. And Guts gives in because he has no choice. Look at his arm! That has got to be one of the most mangled arms I've ever seen. Certainly not an arm capable of wielding a blade like Dragon Slayer. And then what follows is that clip that I just played. There's a lot that goes into what makes this scene work, and that includes the analysis. You have Wiz saying down to the last one in Gus's analysis, and Boomstick saying kill every last one of them in Dimitri's analysis, as they show the respective clips of those characters saying those lines. Basically, they're using these moments as a means of subtly connecting the characters with one another, and the viewer who watched the analysis is rewarded by seeing that very connection unsubtly referenced in the animation. Even the visuals help sell this, not just with the fire, but on Guts' side of things, the colors flicker from the normal colors to black and white, like Berserk's manga panels, with some speed lines and even the blood on Guts' face further supporting the reference to the manga's inking style without contrast with the white coloring. Combine that with the zoom in on their eyes and the build up from the music, it's one of the best best setups to a climax that the show has ever done. And then you have the Berserker armor transformation with its bone-chillingly stiff animation. Well, there's a reason for that. One major point of this scene was that Guts was letting the Beast of Darkness take control. So this stiff animation is supposed to be the Berserker armor contorting and controlling his body like a puppet. Combine that with the RGB pops as the helmet swallows Guts' head, the blood circling his arm, and the visceral roar he does make this such a monstrous transformation. And then Dimitri activates his awakened state, which, despite Despite being a much shorter animation, has just as much impact with how it dispels the fire around him, and with that soft boom sound that also sounds like a roar. And then they start fighting one another with intense and fast attacks that sweep through each other. The screen can't even keep up with their attacks or the blood that's being shed. But then Dimitri stops swinging to look for another opening, where Guts responds with a punch to the face. But Dimitri recovers from the blow to dodge Guts' attack and finds one last opening, sets up atrocity, and ah, critical hit on this is it! Even Dimitri agrees with that! And Finally! It's over. Dimitri limply pulls Eredvar out of Guts and walks off. But wait! Guts is still alive? He broke Eredvar? No, 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 what, what, what? They wanted- wait, wait, what, what, what? What? Did he die? Huh? What's going on here? Uh, wait, wait, Dimitri's fighting for him? <laughs> <sighs> Singer posted a tweet saying that this was his favorite ending that they had done up to that point, and just like the last few times Death Battle did something like this, a minimum of 70% of the community adamantly claimed that the team overhyped it. 
because Martel forbid one person getting to express happiness for the work they do as opposed to millions of people who never get the chance to do that ever. A while back, I made some community posts asking my audience what they thought of Death Battle's previous attempts at emotional endings, which included Gods vs. Dimitri. In sugary fashion, I didn't give my two cents. I just simply uploaded the shot of each ending and captioned, Discuss. Which I eventually had to change the wording to discuss this ending because some people thought I was referring to the entire episode outside of the ending for some reason. But regardless, the responses were relatively close to what I was expecting. Gus vs. Dimitri's ending was generally the most well-received aside from Magneto vs. Tetsuo's. The other ones, while also discussed positively, had more issues brought up. It's too abrupt. The chandelier wasn't positioned correctly. The meta-narrative holds it back for me. I have a lot to say about you, so I'll cross that bridge when I get there. But the worst you can say about Gus vs. Dimitri's ending is that it's sort of abrupt, but even then, I'd argue that the abruptness works to its favor. In the episode's commentary, it's explained that the purpose of the shot of Gus roaring in Dimitri's face is to show that the red glow in his eye is meant to convey that the Berserker armor is in control. And then the next time we see his eye, it's blanked out meaning that the Berserker armor is no longer in control. It's left intentionally ambiguous as to whether the Berserker armor lost control the moment Guts ran out of blood, or, the more riveting explanation, the Berserker armor already lost control and Guts himself powered through the pain in an attempt to get one last swing. Either way, this episode ratios Deku vs. Asta, and that is supremely base. Even without that, the shot lingered long enough already with Guts breaking Eridvar getting a slow-mo shot, as well as a full second of showing Dimitri getting knocked to the floor. Then it cuts immediately to the shot of Guts' sword stopping mid-swing, because with the previous shot, the viewer would still believe that Guts is still alive, and the shock from the realization should stay fresh in their head. Once Guts' attack gets abruptly cut off, the viewer would be hit with a sudden questioning of why Guts stopped his attack. And then the next two shots, would act as confirmation that Guts did actually die to Dimitri's finisher. This was the most common reaction I saw while checking out various reactions to this episode, so I think it's safe to say that the intentional abruptness worked in its favor more than it didn't. And I also believe that if they added another shot of Guts swinging his sword down in between these shots, the reveal of Guts' blood running out wouldn't have hit hard enough since Guts' eye would have removed the intended ambiguity and the fake out wouldn't work. Even the music cutting off earlier wouldn't work much better because the music is meant to match the moment when Dimitri's reaction, and by extension the viewers, settles down as he sees Guts standing here in death. And no, I don't think this was a case of most people not getting it because they were still able to tell that Guts died. They just weren't sure if it was due to atrocity, the armor accumulating enough blood, or a combination of both. Which, side note, the analysis directly says that the Berserker armor will kill Gus once he runs out of blood, but the ending is still unconventional for Death Battle to a point where I can understand people getting confused by it. My magic staff. Oh, and it's also worth noting that Erdvar breaking is a reference to Fire Emblem's weapon durability mechanic. This is another reason why Dimitri is playing defensive for most of the fights, and why he never actually lands that many hits. Especially since the abilities he uses accumulates its usage even faster, with Atrocity intending to be the final blow. I don't think they should do this again when we get more Fire Emblem episodes, but I'm still so happy that they did it here because it's such a good attention to detail. And finally, there's the ending bit of Dimitri realizing that being shackled to the dead was what drove Guts' slaughter. Like with Magneto vs. Tetsuo, this whole realization was subtly built up from the beginning. He starts off showing no respect nor restraint in slaughtering him, demonstrating even less after his face got smashed, getting used to his interesting fighting style except for a last-ditch effort he didn't see coming, and after laying in awe for his efforts to power through what he thought was the final blow, he sees something in him and fights the demon that's out to take his soul. I think that the most common issue I saw for this ending in the community post, excluding the people who were reasonably confused by its framing, was that Dimitri's moon jump was too funny looking and- <laughs> <laughs> Alright, fair enough, I'll give you that one. Although I could also imagine people seeing some inconsistencies in his characterization. Like, if this is supposed to be vengeful Dimitri with a black and white outlook on murderers, why would he fight Guts' battles out of respect? Well, here's another angle to look at. During my Season 8 ranking retrospective, I was heavily critical of Korra vs. Storm. This was mainly due to its confused characterization, which I outright said was the worst of the season. I also sort of entertained the idea that Death Battle may have wanted to represent Korra's character arc in the fight, albeit it didn't seem like that was the intent. With Guts vs. Dimitri, they were doing exactly that. It's all meant to be symbolic of his character arc. After all, aren't well-written character arcs a big reason why we love great characters? Some people might call this a whole blue curtains moment, even though Dimitri's flag is basically a blue curtain in and of itself, but I understand. The cynical asshole personality is very popular among self-proclaimed free thinkers. And it's also like what Guts said, save the high and mighty crap until you're dead. But if he's gonna die, I say he has a right to be all high and mighty for the sake of others, just like what Byleth taught him. 
Well, that was an epic animation, but this is a versus show, so we gotta talk about their explanation on why Dimitri won. Yeah, it's a good conclusion. They acknowledged that Guts would be just over two times faster, but Dimitri's sword breaker and seal movement would close the gap. And then they talk about how his lightning magic would hinder Guts when he gets a hit, be it with his magic or with Eredvar channeling it. Also, shoutouts to the quote-unquote rawest manga panel ever getting a direct callback in this conclusion. That's actually pretty cool. They spend the rest of the conclusion elaborating on the javelins of light feet. I mean, there are a few other things mentioned in the Q&A that Herschel and DJ made, and since it's not in the episode, I'll link it in the description and pinned comment below. But the thing about this Javelins of Light feat, they frame it as a durability feat. And how did Dimitri win the fight? By outlasting the Berserker armor. Though, yes, they did say that Dimitri would be as powerful as a Javelin, but the actual feat they're referring to is Dimitri scales to Rhea's dragon form who tanked two Javelins of Light. Though it's true that they scaled him to base form Edelgard who was able to help Byla take down Rhea in her dragon form, and then Dimitri was able to defeat Edelgard's hegemon form, and he would also scale to Byla, which, for those who got lost in the scaling chain I gave, they're saying that Dimitri could tank a Javelin, and his strength and power would be on par. And the fight also features Atrocity technically being enough to kill Guts since the idea behind the fake out was to make the viewer think that Guts survived the attack, only to abruptly show that he didn't. This is one of, if not the most brilliant moments of cohesion between animation and conclusion because the team put in the extra effort to make this emotional ending show that Dimitri would be strong enough to kill Guts in the Berserker armor and tough enough to outlast it, thereby justifying the amount of emphasis on the Javelins of Light feat and demonstrating multiple win conditions for Dimitri all at once. Although there are people who passionately disagree with this episode's research, and again, it always has to be passionate hatred. Why can't it just be civil disagreement one time? I won't address any of the numbers-related complaints because versus debating is subjective, and it's fruitless to criticize people who think that the numbers for the Javelins of Light or even the meteor dodging feats are inaccurate. And there are also a few extra details mentioned in the Q&A that aren't super important, but are still enough to be addressed via text boxes in my video. However, there is one criticism that I will address here, but only because it does not apply to this. There are people who say that Dimitri shouldn't have used magic because he's not very proficient with it. Okay, for one, while it is locked in some classes, that's a game mechanic thing. And after Link vs. Cloud 2021, where they let Cloud have access to every materia at once, I think it's reasonable to let Dimitri have access to magic, even if he's not a true magician. And even then, being bad at magic doesn't mean he can't use it. That's the equivalent of saying that Sonic shouldn't be allowed to use Chaos Control because he has limited experience with it. Oh wait! I remember a time when Death Battle used that exact argument, and I also remember so many people rightfully calling them out on it. Why would you want to see this again? Two. Well, he's not the most proficient in it. He's not the most proficient in it. Not the most proficient. Not the most proficient. Not the most proficient. Three. The fight didn't make the magic as potent as you might think. Dimitri only uses it twice in the fight, but the first time he uses it, it doesn't work. Although the second time, it does work, but it's a desperation move that only lands because Guts is tunnel visioned on trying to overpower Dimitri again. Oh, and side note, I'm pretty sure that this is supposed to be Thoron, which would mean that he uses four Thunders and two Thorons, which is the only magic he's capable of learning in three houses, which is another epic attention to detail. And four, I guess if the conclusion framed the magic as his ace in the hole, then I could understand why people are so hyper fixated on this. But if you really think about it, the magic was practically a footnote in the grander scheme of their argument. They never said that his magic was a better ranged option than Guts' projectiles. They were basically saying that Dimitri had a bigger arsenal, which did not just include his magic, but also things like seal movement and sword breaker. And yes, they did say Guts' armor and Dragon Slayer were vulnerable conductors of electricity, but like, Dimitri can just channel lightning through Eredvar. Even if magic was considered a better ranged option than Guts' projectiles or something, are you seriously gonna try and gaslight me by saying, oh, Dimitri only won because he had magic, as opposed to, oh, I don't know, being at minimum thousands of times stronger than Guts' And having a myriad of hacks that directly affects his kid specifically? Be real, people! Come on! Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I think this is where all that sugar's starting to kick in. Let's chill out and talk about this one last thing that especially needs to be addressed with civil discussion. Something from Guts vs. Nightmare that the Death Battle team to this day has never directly addressed even when they revisited the episode. And I'm pretty sure at this point you would know where I'm going with this. Well, Nightmare wields more power than Guts. This is what Guts does every single day. This 
line is kind of a meme at this point, and I've already made my case on this before, but it should be adequate to bring it up again here, especially since I do have something new to say about this. Their argument for Guts winning essentially boils down to, even though Guts has never shown power anywhere close to nightmares, he should just win because he loves that Dragon Slayer sword. Yeah, it shouldn't be surprising why this is the worst conclusion in Death Battle history, and yes, I know what's in the same season, what came before, and what came after, and I still stand by this. Also, it's really funny how they initially used his fight against Nosferatu Zod as proof of Guts beating foes stronger than him, despite the fact that... <laughs> yeah. But there is some nuance that a lot of people neglect to talk about, myself included. I'm pretty sure we all forgot this, but versus debating was drastically different back then compared to now. People like to complain that death battle arguments boil down to who can punch with more tons of TNT and who is more times faster than light, but that's not death battle's fault. That's just how versus debating is nowadays. Back then, they were entirely based around assumptions and context of who the characters are in their worlds, and scaling for stats was not fleshed out during the time. Do you want to know why death battle often avoided universal and multiversal arguments? arguments for so long? Because most people had no idea what they were supposed to mean unless if it was super obvious to a casual viewer. And even with the ones everyone knew could get that high, Death Battle still avoided them, and the amount of times they didn't avoid them barely took more than one hand to count on. Does this mean that those older episodes' research and verdicts are devoid of criticism? Oh, no, of course not! But with a few exceptions here and there, Death Battle did reflect the common verdicts and reasoning of said verdicts a lot more accurately in their time period than we remember. In other words, yes, the consensus used to be that Sonic and Tails could beat Mario and Luigi respectively just because they could run really fast. And yes, people believed that Scorpion's awesome ninja techniques and ties to the Nether Realm would make him too much for Ryu. And yes, SNK characters were considered large continental with nothing to back it up. What the hell is this? And yes, people did believe that Guts was more powerful than most characters in fiction exclusively because he has endured a lot of pain and trauma. And if I need to explain to you how f***ed up it is when saying it out loud, then social awareness is officially dead. And although they're less prevalent today, you'll still find a surprising chunk of people saying, It doesn't matter how powerful you are! Guts has endured so much trauma and pain that he will never lose in a fight! And if you get hit with one thwack from his sword, you will die! So you're saying that Guts is a Mary Sue. This line in particular shaped the perception of Guts in versus debates for so many years. But the question is, did they need to address it in Guts's return to death battle? Not extensively, no, but maybe at least a line subtly referring to it would have been nice. And hey, that's exactly what we got. Guts could power through some of Eridfar's damage, but he wasn't invincible and could not heal from fatal wounds. But I also like to think that this reflects something deeper. I think that this shows the difference in not just how death battle viewed Guts, but how the internet viewed media as a whole. Back then, Berserk was renowned for its dark content and badass main character with a big sword. I won't deny that his raw fighting style was what got me to push through the Black Swordsman arc in spite of… yes. But ever since the beginning of what I like to call the analytical era of YouTube, aka the dawn of video essays, more people started to see Gus for his character development and the powerful emotions that his story brings. People didn't just see Gus's big sword as a cool weapon, but as something symbolic that means something to Gus and Berserk as a whole. Does this make the older reception of Guts wrong? There are people who claim that after all, but does that make them correct? Well, what I think more people should take into account is that through both interpretations, Guts has always been renowned for his perseverance and resilience. Back then, it was viewed as a way of how he persevered in fights, but now, majority of Berserk fans consider it as a part of his personality and what makes his story resonate with so many people. And with that in mind, I think that both lenses are valid ways to view any work of fiction, and Guts vs. Dimitri's ending works as proof of that. Honestly, I'd go as far as to argue that this is the main reason why Death Battle is one of the only shows from the early internet days that's still going strong. They've adapted to the change in how many people on YouTube see their favorite media, while still maintaining their classic roots to some degree. And while the quality may vary, they put effort into celebrating the characters and the series that they bring onto the show. It's gotten to a point where the versus side of this versus show almost feels secondary because the concept of who would win in a fight can only carry a show for so long. And I feel like Season 10, specifically this shot of Guts standing in front of the moon, was the moment where they decided to put their foot down and take characterization far more seriously than ever before. And given that the following episodes have done a great job of keeping this statement consistent, I'm inclined to keep thinking that way. So, it should come as no surprise to anyone that all of this is not why Guts vs. Dimitri is my favorite episode. 
Look, I'm a sucker for thematic notes, but it's also kind of a lame reason to call something your favorite. Especially in my case, where I came from a time period where so many people tried to, for lack of a better term, pull a Caesar. And if you don't know what that means, here's a small wall of text that explains its history and why it doesn't work most of the time. Feel free to pause the video if you want to read it. Regardless, Guts vs. Dimitri is my favorite death battle for very undeep reasons. It has my favorite writer giving it his all, my favorite cutaway gag of the show, a grounded fight with Arsenal's youth to their fullest, references implemented in creative ways, an ending that encapsulates the exact reason why I like both characters, one of my favorite tracks of the season, and a conclusion that makes sense by the episode's logic and cleverly ties into the fight's choreography. Also, it just so happens to feature my second favorite character from Fire Emblem Three Houses. Dorothea. Not to mention, minor spoilers for my Season 10 ranking retrospective, the episodes that came after had problems that happened to bother me more than any issue I took with Gus vs. Dimitri. This includes, but is not limited to, a peculiarly structured analysis that does not benefit either character, a poorly written conclusion, an underwhelmingly written pair of analyses, the most bizarre genre of pacing issues, some awkward directorial choices, an impression that's a tad too inconsistent for my liking, action that gets really samey, and yes, even issues with characterization. And Death Battle is going to make these mistakes again in Season 11, and however long they decide to keep going. But there's a reason why the title of this video says Sought Redemption instead of Earned Redemption. Sought is the past tense of seek, which means something along the lines of to look for or make an attempt to gain. This doesn't mean they found it or that they've been forgiven of their poor research, but it's like I said earlier, nobody stays perfect the moment they experience growth. It's about the efforts made to atone for their past failures and learn from them by moving forward. And in this case, Death Battle doesn't need to make a big stand or a long apology video for how their episodes used to be handled. They can seek redemption by making good content that they want to make. Even if Death Battle messes up in a few areas, I reckon that it's safe to say it's never done with malicious intent. But let's not lie, Season 10 is just the best season of Death Battle right now. You don't need to do a lot of digging or mental gymnastics to justify that. Not only does it have a consistent amount of the show's all-time best, but it truly feels like the culmination of how far they've come. I've never seen a season that expresses this much love for the characters. I've never seen a season with this much technical polish. I've never seen a season that has viewed itself in retrospect to this degree. And frankly, I don't think we'll ever get a season like this again, but that's okay. As long as they keep making great content and demonstrate how much fun they're having while making it, that's all that matters to me. After all, it's like what Chad James once said, there's more than one way to appreciate something. And likewise, I feel like there's more than one way to appreciate death battle in general. Okay, Benjamin, I am such a huge Soul Calibur fanboy that I publicly admitted to have written Soul Calibur fanfiction B-Singer. Give Soul Calibur a third Death Battle episode already. Like, seriously, what is stopping you aside from nothing? <laughs> There's no Tooth Fairy, there's no Easter Bunny, and there is no Gru versus Megamind. Kinda hurts to say that one out loud, not gonna lie. <laughs>